get my little red light, start broadcast. There we go. We are online. Clickety clack, clickety clack. Lay all the light bulb. Nyum, 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 nyum. Troubles in paradise. The methodology of creative. Remember typewriters? Remember analog clocks? Wee. There we go. TortukanWordPress.com. There's my website. I am James Downer J to uh, people who uh, uh, want to call me RJ. Uh, in Paradise is on the methodology of creationism. I've been working for 20 some odd years. I know I'm on the website and the YouTube world. And my goal is to obliterate anti evolutionism and woo one source at a time and to make the methodology involved so clear that everybody else is doing it too. And that's a tough road to hoe. Anyway, we'll stop sharing this little thing. And we can close that off. Hello, gang. We've got a bunch of guests here, a bunch of little topics. Uh, we've got camp. We can boot at our leisure. Uh, we've got a uh, friendly atheist or a frustrated atheist. we got Lord Crocker Squirrel, who is always known for a sanguine temperament. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the old RJ here. Um, uh, as uh, um, they uh, take a very conventional party line of um, uh, differentiating between the human beings that are human-y, human-y, there's no variation, they never came from anything that was not human, okay, and then you got the knots over in the Australopithecine side, and then the kind of, well, we have to figure out, people can check up on it themselves, uh, so I, I didn't put any material up today, but it's still continuing the process that if you look up and taken the answers in Genesis answers book series and we're doing quite a few of them in the course of this no one's really done a full press analysis of these before and uh, Jackson having read my uh, evolution slam dunk uh, was inspired to say hey uh, we could do this uh, together and he's writing most of the chapters he's he's deciding which ones he wants to tackle and he, he gave me the radiometric dating one uh, that I'm doing and I'm gonna be doing some stuff also on flood geology and that later on and so it's a collaborative process that's going on. Advantages and pitfalls of a methods approach, uh, cap and uh, frustrated, uh, because of what they've been doing on ferreting out some quote mining regarding were the founding fathers Christian or not. So uh, if you'd like to give a little bit of a, of a heads up on that, we have some useful methods lessons to bring up on that. Um, yeah, do you want to start frustrated? Uh, frustrated has been raptured. <laughs> Yeah. No, you can go ahead. I'm driving that. Oh, oh, okay. Do okay. you not want to talk during Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, you, you, Cap, can give the, uh, the the brief thing, or do you want me to summarize you? Yeah. <laughs> well, basically, me and Frustrated, we were just kind of an offline hangout, just talking, and we came across this guy who was quoting founders, and we saw an ellipsis kind of raised our suspicions of. Which is a you dot, know, dot, dot this, for all of those yeah. totally uh, uh, unaware. Yeah. We're like, maybe this is a quote mine. And he kept saying things that I knew just was not right. Um, one quote was, uh, Jefferson said, I'm a real Christian as I follow the doctrines of Jesus. And right before that, he talks about cutting up the Bible and only keeping the moral parts, which yeah. if anybody knows history, yeah. that would be Jefferson's Bible because he believed in the moral teachings of Christ, but not. You know, yeah, actual, not his divinity. He didn't believe yeah. in a virgin birth um, by any stretch of the imagination. And, by by uh, uh, Henry Moore's creationist standards, uh, Jefferson was not. Yeah. Uh, another one was a Franklin quote, which said he believed in a creator God, which, get this, deists believe in a creator God. And in the same letter, a paragraph down or so, just a few sentences down <laughs> in like the next paragraph, he says, um, although Jesus of Nathers, although the one that you have my questions on, I question his divinity. I mean, straight out says, I don't think Jesus was Christ. Yeah. And this was, I this was I thought Christian. was extremely interesting of, uh, the friends that he had, uh, yeah. that, uh, if this was in the late 1790s, this was right around the same period when Joseph Priestley, who was a Unitarian and the guy that almost discovered oxygen, he thought it was phlogiston. Um, he was a Unitarian who was literally hounded out of England. His house was burned down. He almost literally was tarred and feathered. This was in a very tense time because of the French Revolution going on, and uh, there was it was like the same amount of tension that we get with the communists and all that in the, in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. Uh, that everyone was picking sides. Anyway, he left and he came to America. It was when this letter was dated. Now, that would be in that period where the French Revolution was just beginning and shit was starting to hit the fan. And uh, uh, so always important reminders about how I approach things from a methods direction. And I think we're getting feedback in the audio again. I 
shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. No. I mean, I've, I, 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 I turned my headset down in case. Uh, I think there's something that was buffering, but um, maybe that was it. Buffering. Oh, buffering. Anyway, um, the, the thing was, two issues about quote mining. One is you want to track down the original source, which is critical. But also, you really do want to investigate the quote mine. It's a useful measure of things. Don't forget the quote mine itself. Who made the quote mine? Where did the quote mine get the quote? Was the quote mine a collection of quote mines? And, and so those things are very useful. The, very, the venues they come from, what websites they're obtaining things from, how popularly used are the quotes, uh, are they uh, uh, used in certain circles and certain apologetic things. All of that is important information from a methods direction in addition to just how head up it ass it wrong is in relationship to the original text string. So some of the tricks that you learn in the scholarly method uh, game is how to search for fragments of the quote to try to track down where quote mine it was from because not all of them are going to be the same. So uh, particular wordings, particular places that are capitalized, particular placements of ellipses, if there's variations there, when they give a source, uh, uh, some of them won't. They'll just say, quote from Thomas Jefferson, and they'll give absolutely nothing about it. The ones that are the most interesting to track down are ones where, say, Thomas Jefferson letter to somebody, or you know, they'll give a, a, a detail that's sort of a reference. Yeah. Type in that exactly. So often you can take like the last end of the quote and the section where it bumps into the reference uh, a detail, type that in precisely because if they are an anal retentive parasite, they will have copied it exactly because they'll be, they don't want to make any mistake. They're copying it. Boop, 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 boop. And you find that over and over and over again. And that's how you can track down stuff. I did that very mechanism a couple of weeks ago when I tracked down uh, how Kent Hoban was lifting an entire lecture from Hiram Yaya. Uh, website on um, uh, the uh, Archaeopteryx fossil, line by line by line by line by line. And I only found that out because I did a, a, a full text fragment search. Oh my God, he went after Archaeopteryx. Like really? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, like oh, that's yeah. oh, that, like that's that, even a question. That's a transition. He he he. Uh, yes, he jumped off. He jumped the shark. He jumped multiple sharks. Uh, the the brief presses of what went on on this. Uh, so a, a video. I don't watch a lot of nincompoop video because he's so bloody repetitive. Um, but as it was, this one was anticipating what it would be about, and I was completely 100% right. Yeah. But, um, whenever you have a fossil and you cut it directly in half, it's uh, both sides. That's the yeah. But there were two actual counts. animals involved. One was an ancient oh, yeah. bird. And the other one was, and the point is, they found full Microraptor fossils since then, and that was way more interesting than Archaeoraptor ever was. Oh yeah. So I was curious to see whether or not uh, a parasitical nincompoop uh, Holbin was ever going to bring up Archaeo a Microraptor, and no, he didn't. But along the way, oh, it got way better than that, because uh, along the way, when he was going after um, Archaeopteryx and bringing up the inevitable Allen fiducia. Uh, that's when I began to wonder where he was getting his information from. And that's when I started text searching and discovered, oh, a Harun Yahya posting. Hmm. I mean, wait a little bit. And then a little later on, I'm checking again. I'm going, gosh, yes, the wording of this is very specific and odd. I don't think it's an Alan Fiducia article. It must be somebody commenting on Fiducia. So I did another text search. Harun Yahya. So then I went back and oh, I backed the whole bloody tape up. Uh, uh, to watch back about 15, 20 minutes there and to start from the beginning because then I had pulled up the Harun Yahya material that I could now have as a transcript and I followed line by line by line without deviation. His entire segment in that PowerPoint was from Harun Yahya, but it was worse than that. He hadn't read it first. And the uh -oh. reason why you could tell that is because when he was hitting some terms and names and descriptions, he was stumbling on them. Well, whatever that is, or I, I don't know who that name is. I don't know how to pronounce that. He'd never read it. He'd never pre-vetted it. He had such low respect for his audience, like anyone expects him not to, uh, <laughs> that it, he hadn't even looked at his own material, which meant somebody else, a minion, must have obtained this information or um, uh, Hovind had seen this stuff and it had all sorts of information in it and a minion put it into the PowerPoint and literally he was seeing it for the very first time as he was plowing along I think, this material. I think a very, very um, reasonable uh, thing to say would be that 
most likely a minion put it all together, gave him the yeah. key um, information, like on uh, some kind of flashcards, he can follow along and be able to say whatever it was. And well, he then was, whenever he, he got was, to a name, uh, he was just uh, like, uh, I don't know. He was know. pretty much reading it verbatim off of the off of the PowerPoint. Uh, um, uh, originality is not Hogan's strong suit. Anyway, as if this wasn't bad enough, of Kent Hovin credulously relying on a minion, copying material slavishly from Ninkampu, uh, uh, Islamic creationist Harun Yaya, um, he then went off the deep end even more because he began to insist at the end of the thing, after he'd gotten off of that PowerPoint, that Archaeopteryx was a fake, that the, the Archaeopteryx things were proven to be fakes back in the 1980s. And this is one of those hang the head in, oh my God, you're way behind the curve on this one, Bucky. Holy moly! Oh, because yeah, of that, that, the two photographers and the bull and yeah, the photographers in the museum who took really crappy pictures and then said, "Well, this is a fake." Yeah, like and the they only dealt with the one the right there. That we could buy. <laughs> their their argument that uh, it was in part involved Fred Hoyle. It was a nutball in many respects. It was in a photography journal. All of the articles on it were in the photography journal. They were not in regular paleontology stuff. There was a demolition of it, I think, in Science or Nature, where they just blew them to smithereens. But the main problem, not only was their initial analysis fl flawed, but we found Archaeopteryx since in the Solenhofen, a bunch of them. And so the idea that some 19th century forger who made the London specimen is still knocking around, churning these damn things out, and somehow burying them inside of the slabs for people to find in the 21st century, um, is uh, just absolutely preposterous. No, that it's, uh, it's just nonsense. But Porvin is so far behind the curve on this one that it never dawned on him to check up on any of this stuff. So when he's accusing the paleontologists of lying, no, Kent Hovind is the liar. He is repeating the lie. His claim that Archaeopteryx is a, is a fraud is a falsehood, and, and he should be ashamed of himself. Not only that, it reminded me of an incident that was... Steve Meyer, the first time I bought a design guy up in uh, Whitworth College here in Spokane, uh, when he was trotting that out in 1998, uh, where he tried to imply that maybe there a uh, fraud to Archaeopteryx, and I immediately put my hand up and I said, no, that was refuted at the time, wasn't it? And he immediately backpedaled and agreed with me, yes, it was. In which case, why was he bringing it up at all? It was purely apologetics and, and evasive and pathetic. So in that respect, there is a, a, a sense in which you can say that Steve Meyer from the Discovery Institute thinks like Kent Hovind. Now, now, RJ, RJ, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you just have to realize that it was God and, and God did everything. And all that is just all nonsense. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah, well I, the piece is that Kent is not arguing no, that position. He's not just saying that, that it's God doing it. He isn't even trying to explain I, why or what the fossils were or whatever else. I, now, he's flat out accusing the paleontologist of fraud. And, and for him to do this secondarily this way is scurrilous and libelous and stupid. So there was a, a long string. This It turned out that watching this stupid video was extremely useful for a change because everything in it was wrong. It was a 100% failure rate. And if I can ever get, if Peter can get me going with that discussion with Kent Hovind, I'm going to talk over this one with him. Yeah, and <laughs> really uh, to one, one thing in the chat that Brian Stevens said about kind of what you're saying with all about, so we see the creators up to their old nonsense. Yeah, yeah. Not right. they can't avoid it. The same, it's the same method over and over Arcade. again. Yeah. Arcade. It's called narrative. That's why he brought it up. Yeah, the narrative here is to discredit as much as the as much science yeah. as he can uh, as a result of the wedge document, if anybody remembers that part. Oh, old scratch puts up a comment that I must because could it be Satan? <laughs> mm. Anyway, I'm about it. Uh, we're not quite old at the midpoint. I'll go ahead and stick he? my uh, uh my um uh thing up here because it, it, I'll be going next to the next point of issue. Let me go through my magical RJ, find the buttons. To this. I, I guess it's uh, only fair that we do about 15 minutes early this week because we did about 15 minutes late last week. Yeah, well, it's not, yeah. It's not, so there's my patrons, uh, Stephen Dyer, Andrew, uh, Eat, you, Mona, Hendrel, Jen, Jody, Daniel, Ralph, Eric, Benjamin, Staggles, Alex, Cyrus, Totes Real, Everett, and Paul. Thank you all for being patrons, even though the money doesn't actually get to me because Patreon is a bunch of 
wackaloons uh, over there. Uh, here's my website again. Please have that on the thing. Say hi. Uh, download all the material. It's all the PDFs there are there to be shared. You can get at them. Uh, if you really want to help the project, uh, www.gofundme.com DC go. That gets to me really like lickety split, and uh, that helps a lot. I'm still waiting for that crowd. At the moment, we have 171 people on the planet who have actually helped GoFundMe. I think there could be more than that. And anybody who has enough scratch to be able to like do that $60 a year, $5 a month pledge kind of a thing that the PBS people do, that one would help enormously. If 100 people did that, holy moly, I could buy a new pair of shoes and ink. Anyway, um, we uh, stopped sharing on that one for the moment. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, actually, I... Uh, on the on the methods issue, before I bring up the um, the new book project, uh, I'll just want to say that that there's a bunch of little tool techniques then that everyone can use. Uh, just as um, you guys uh, are intrigued by the Christian nation uh, claim, uh, Christian America element, so that's something you want to track down because it's something that's very much an interest to you. Some people will have biological subjects, some people will have cosmological things involving stars, some might like dinosaurs, some might like, there's going to be something somebody's going to be intrigued in, and creationism bumps into almost everything. So what you want to do, no matter what the topic is, is you want to track down where they're getting their information from and if you do debates or discussions with them either online by text or in videos or any other context you want to do the same thing i tried to do with c brown last week which was to track down where they're getting their information from and and investigate that methods issue then also you want to know what the information is so you want to have tried as much as possible to get primary sources i bet both of you will agree that when you find the primary source material, you end up learning more than you knew before. Yeah, and that's always well, that's always that's always going to be the case, especially yeah. if you if your creationist stuff. The Book of Genesis is absolutely hilarious. <laughs> yeah, and, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll recommend uh, uh, Richard Crum, I think, or or uh, I may have, uh, Crum 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 his last name Crum. Um, his uh, illustrated Genesis is an absolute hoot. He's from the old uh, hot smoking 1960s, and he went through and did um, uh, a lot of record covers and a lot of stuff. But anyway, just fairly recently, he did a complete illustrated Genesis. And by him putting pictures to every single verse, all the begats, all of the foreskin mentions, all of the little side oh, issues, you know, oh I mean, that, that not only do you get the heavy hitter stuff, the, 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 the big ticket Cecil B. DeMille moments, the, the Noah's frame, 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 where you can't slip past it. It's too easy to slip past it if, you, if you're just reading text. But when you got pictures, no, you got to notice yeah. it. And anybody who can yeah. plow and through Genesis and not go, RJ, oh, this is strange. Um, yeah, I was going to say, uh, Animal Man said something about uh, I'm going to chat to you. Did you see it? You said uh, even oh, fiduciary. Fiduciary, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fiduciary is an evolutionist, and he's still digging in his heels. He doesn't like the dinosaur model. He's never been able to offer a paleontological argument for mm. where dinosaurs came from. And his anti-dinosaur arguments have disintegrated bit by bit. The digit frame shift issue, which I've mentioned before, and uh, uh, the paleontological cladistic analyses. There's no coincidence that he doesn't like doing cladism, which is the analytical technique you, you, you use to test phylogenetic models. Um, on um, a, a thing here about... Uh, oh, um, uh, Brian was asking, let me guess, uh, uh, C. Brown never came through on his sources. Oh, no. Other than just repeating the same things over and over again. Uh, there were four issues that came up, and you can see uh, if you uh, endure the, the tape. And I was getting peeved, uh, not because I was having trouble bringing up evidence, and, and the other people on the panel were having no trouble doing that either. It's that he just couldn't be shut up long enough yeah. to engage don't with a C Brown. Uh, the, the C Brown types are just <laughs> or anything like that, but but these other types are just annoying as hell. And uh, you'll, you'll encounter them occasionally and you find that they just don't play well on this. Well, um, so we're about um, uh, halfway through the show. I want to get to the main attraction, which is the discussion of the new book. I got to get my uh, stupid um, uh, screen shares and and all that up again. Uh, like if I ever have a better software and stuff that I don't currently have, uh, that might indeed involve money, which I don't have to get. So at the moment, I'm just running the old-fashioned um, uh, 
cheat cheat approach, but it's working. And if uh, I, I'll tell you this, anybody who is thrown off by the medium rather than the message is in the wrong line. Of, if you mm -hmm. decide that somebody is, uh, well, they don't have the graphics down and they're really clumsy on their audio and things like that, instead of the content, I am never thrown off by, by media format. A, a creationist, if they bring up a work, they can have the glossiest special effects. I don't care. I'm looking for content. If they can be clumsy as all get out, find it dandy. I've, I've seen um, um, every range of presentation. I don't hang up on the presentation part. Anyway, hopefully everybody is seeing my little chart here. And this is not my chart. This is a chart from this creationist book, The Answers in Genesis thing. Uh, Monty White. Uh, uh, is one of the contributors. Jackson Wheat, who couldn't come in, he's uh, at a relative, his dad's uh, today, so he couldn't uh, show up. So we must uh, uh, treat him with great respect and difference and and, uh, uh, and represent his views fairly. Anyway, he and I are doing a, a full court press analysis book on the Answers series, and particularly the, their latest edition of the Answers book two, which includes this Monty uh, article. And uh, um, uh, he's doing a bulk of the writing, and then I'm doing stuff on radiometric dating and flood and other matters, and, and hopefully it will be as well documented as Slam Dunk, and uh, will be yet another useful contribution to the field. Anyway, one of the little blips that Jackson slipped past because he just saw it and saw it, oh, that's dumb, uh, and never really called, called attention to it, but I immediately went, ooh, but dumb is important, was this chart where uh, White had put in the listing of the claims of evolution, and then the versus the claims of Genesis. And then what I did was make some annotations, which are the dates of things coming up, and then also some gray highlighting for all the ones that are absolutely 100% cockamamie wrong, uh, which you'll notice kind of an awful lot of gray along that column. Uh, this is kind of like a pattern. So you've got the fact that these are that according to evolution, sea creatures are appearing before land plants. Well, yeah. Uh, how do you define a sea creature? He doesn't have references. Uh, uh, do the Ediacara biota, do sponges qualify? Is it something that wanders around? And so it's still way before land plants, no matter how you measure it. Um, and a lot of these are curious earthworms before starfish. Well, echinoderms are very specialized versions of uh, starfish or specialized uh, echinoderms. And so there's just a lot of odd choice of terms. But the one that jumped out at me and the reason why I put it in the list was thorns and thistles before man, according to evolution, man before thorns and thistles. And uh -huh. of course, that's because Genesis said so. That according to Genesis, thorns and thistles came about as punishment for Adam's sinning. So now he's got to eat of this plant shit, and they're going to be thorns you're going to have to contend with. So there, that shows you what happens when you disobey God. Ha ha. Well, the problem God is, God knew that was coming. Yeah. Well, he, he's omniscient, God. but has memory lapses. <laughs> he's an Alzheimer's omniscience. <laughs> yeah. What's up with that? Somebody tell me how the hell that is even remotely supposed to work. You know everything that has that has happened, has ever ha that is happening, has ever happened, or will ever happen, and for some strange reason, you didn't expect either. The humans to go bat shit and yeah. disappoint you. Well, it helps if you're a dyslexic Calvinist. Things. It makes it easier to interpret. But anyway, the so I was intrigued about this. Not only does the the thorns before thistles things, it's uh, and before man, it's just dumb. Uh, you got uh, human beings maybe three hundred thousand years ago if we push it back at the moment. But thorns are showing up really early. In plant evolution, uh, there's these cute little lycopods from 400 million years ago in the Devonian that are doing just exactly that. And so, so much for that. Well, the fun part is I put a link up uh, to, um, I'll stop sharing on here. I put a link up to um, the um, uh, catch pool article and also to another cute little bit from, um, uh, um, uh, um, oh, forgotten his uh, name right off there. Anyway, he's a critic, Joel, I think. Uh, who's a critic of um, uh, creationism, and he happened to be pointing out how a British creationist, John McKay, uh, who appeared on Eric Hovind's show back in 2012, uh, was making exactly the same argument, which is that we know, according to the Bible, that the thorns and thistles are after man because it's after the sinning, and therefore all the geology must be wrong, everything. And so it's the all-catch-all technique 
that once you decide you it, it's full of the geology and paleontology and archaeology cockamamie wrong and at the same time though, they don't take that data field and really try to fit it into their model because all the fossils that we would find in the fossil record of thorns present model because they cannot establish a comp a working map of time their bible That's is correct. absolutely pointless for this purpose everything okay, is roughly this and roughly Hunter, that yeah they're frustrated well but, yeah, here, here, is, here is the absolute fun part somehow or another uh between usher and another bloke a look a little bit later they managed to pin down the time of that the time and date of creation to nine in the morning on october the 23rd 4004 bce oh yeah that this four bce oh yeah that this was I yeah this was later, later. Oh, okay. yeah, jump in jump in frustrated atheist you you've been stomped on a couple times <laughs> oh I, I wasn't saying anything right now oh okay All I said was well that, the, the yeah the the chronology oh, issue you still record. find you still find crazy in here's, fact i, I call a question to it for you that might actually that that might actually be apropos uh if kent is uh, is borrowing from uh, yaha mm -hmm. or yeah yeah whatever it is. yeah yeah it's easy yeah, to remember yeah, yeah. if you say it that way uh, plus it's insulting yeah yeah, yeah I, I get it if kent is borrowing from him and he's borrowing from some other idiot what is what does it mean when eric steals all of his dad's best material exactly <laughs> and and so this is the daisy chain parasitism issue that is pathological amongst anti-evolutionists uh, as much as dog barking is at uh yeah, sorry at, about uh, that guys and to not make up his mind clearly about how long ago the flood was he was literally in in one paper that he did Back in the 1980s, he calculated that the flood, if I'm not mistaken, had established the date of the flood as 1642 BC. Yeah, and that and that is weirdly different than 2350 BC. So basically, it's bounced all over the map depending upon how you want to do it from scripture. So here is the supposedly absolutely clear as a bell, completely non-contradictory, absolute measure of things. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 give me a source if you can later on, if you can put in a thing on that uh, 16 BC, or BC date, because that, that's a juicy little piece of information to put in. I, I actually funny. have to, you see, there's two things here. One, I have to, I have to figure out where Aaron Ra got that information, hmm. probably from Usher's own papers. And then okay, I have well, to you can pester him on that. That's a task assigned to you, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but because not, it, but it, it's it, funny it because would be an interesting blip. They they like to sit there and say, "Oh, you know, um, the quote unquote evolutionist." They like to sit there and uh, they can't tell us how old things are. They yeah, you know they're, they they're, their their times mind. change all the time. But here we have when when did the flood happen? Oh, uh, I don't know. It could have been at this time. It could have been at that time. We don't, we don't yeah, know. That's a, I made exactly that point in my commentary on it. It said, here, evolutionists are being assailed because on the data field, uh, but uh, uh, the, the creationist is in exactly the same boat. Ironically, actually, evolutionists aren't very pliable on the data thing. Um, and that was another one that I think I pointed out in some other shows. And I can't recall whether or not I've actually got a blip on it in the new book or not. But the fact is, is that uh, they worked out pretty accurately how old uh, the Cambrian was. It was about a half a billion years ago. And this had been worked out before radiometric dating. And then they were able to confirm it and calibrate it a bit. For a while, they were pushing it back even farther into about 600 million years old. But then they did some better datings. And also, it depends on where you define the Cambrian. As you, as you well, How do you define the boundary layer between the Cambrian tax and pre-Cambrian? And it's now been pulled back to where they're, they're now comfortable with about 530, 540 million years ago. But that's still Never only how many years. It's a small amount of percentage if you think about what 600, 500, 550 million years is it's only a few percentage points variety it's it's not like it's a small amount of percentage if you think about what 600 500 gigantic amount of differential and even there a thousand years difference between 2300 and 3300 years is monstrously large uh, a margin of error if is the old chapter three in the old tip uh, you can get it from my website download it read it you know it's a good piece of shit um the uh, where i was saying that that they the, the flood geology measure of the earth 
would be off as if you said I mowed the lawn yesterday when Andrew Jackson was president. It's that kind of proportional yeah. change if you adjust for the scales issue. The other analogy that I used was how um, ridiculous it was to try to figure out how everything was happening at once. Um, uh, the analogy I used was Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street in New York, which I knew from my historical research. Originally, it was just a residential area. And by the 1860s and 70s, the Astor family had a bunch of mansions at that site. And uh, they eventually had very big houses there. And uh, that's the same. They had their, the, uh, her ballroom could hold, Carolyn Astor's ballroom could hold 400 people. And so that was the, the, uh, the 400 was the list of the, the elite people that could fit into the Astor's ballroom. And you were somebody if you were invited and you were nobody if you weren't. And anyway, the, the um, a brother next door, when he died, he passed the house to his kid and he could, the kid couldn't stand his Aunt Caroline. So he tore his house down and built a hotel there, uh, which he called the Waldorf. And this was in the 1880s. And later on, she, uh, uh, Caroline stuck it out for quite a while. Uh, and then finally, she decided that living next door to a 13-story hotel was kind of a drag. So uh, she uh, built a new mansion uptown and uh, tore her house down. And they built a, a duplicate hotel next door that was designed to match up floor by floor, but actually had one more floor so she could overlord it. Uh, so she technically had a bigger one. And they had connecting doors where it came from. And it stayed there until the 1920s when it was torn down to make way for something new. They built a new Waldorf Astoria uptown, which is the one that currently exists, much bigger, and built uh, a building you may have heard of, the Empire State Building, uh, is built on that same site. And in the 1940s, hey, there was JR, a famous... I gotta, yeah? I, I just have to cut in to say I got to go. My horse is calling. Okie dokie. Thank you. Well, we got the information out of the way on the discussion of the uh, uh, research thing. So happy to have you here. You're always a welcome guest. Um, have, a, have a nice day there. Bye. And, uh, in the 1940s, right after the war, um, it was a terribly foggy day in um, uh, New York City. And a B-24 bomber slammed in to the like 82nd floor or something and disconnected some elevator shafts. This woman fell, not to her death, she survived uh, as the elevator crashed down. Uh, it was like a Saturday, so there wasn't a whole lot of people in there and there was debris falling down onto the street and all that fiery engines and all that stuff. One of the engines had impended itself into the elevator shaft and it was uh, a mess. Well, trying to, to forget that that stuff took place in chronology, and if the equivalent of flood geology was to imagine that all of that was happening simultaneously, so that you had people at the at the four hundred balls in Mrs. Astor's house, and then they're trying to enjoy themselves, but they're trying to avoid all the people coming in to register at the hotel for over the eighteen nineties on, and then at the same time they're suddenly startled because the sound of the B twenty four crashing into the Empire State Building. The vid to keep the sound. Oops. Uh, I'm not sure why I've got a problem on that um, from my end or anywhere else. I'm not entirely sure. I'll shut down a few more you things to see what, whether or not that's happening. I've got all my fields down here in terms of, of sources. Uh, oh, um, oh, oh, maybe it's still because I got damn Twitter on. Uh, that could be a problem, too. Uh, uh, let us know if that's any better. Um, we'll see about that. You can actually turn down the amount of bandwidth Hangouts uses if you click on the thing. Oh, that's a new thing I need to know about because I don't know about that. Anyway, it shows you how non-technological the old RJ is. I apologize if it's been a difficult audio. If it's been a difficult audio for everybody, um, in which case I'll have to kind of briefly reprise and... Um, uh, a frustrated atheist uh, were uh, giving us some skivvy on the research that they've done with uh, creationist quote mining stuff on the uh, America was a Christian nation thing and the kind of pointers that you can use to track down source material where you want to find both the primary source and the quote mine source because you can tell about their me mechanism and then um, uh, I was then bringing up some material on the new book that I'm doing with Jackson Wheat on the answers in Genesis thing so um, uh, it's uh, if it gets pulled off, um, naturally, ever have slam dunk uh, should want to have uh, this one, too. And uh, we'll see when we can get this out. Uh, we'll see whether or not we can pull it up. More cutting out. Well, then I have no clue why. What I'm doing here, I've got my fields cut down. It's going to be right there in the middle, all the way up to the top.
Um, let me, uh, it takes a while for it to do its little clicky things here. Yipes. Um, I do. Yeah, I, I see, um, uh, well, I see a little camera, cameraman thing. Is that the one that I want? No, well, you can click that too. But the one next, the, the one directly right of it looks like cell phone bars. Oh, well, I, I'm getting a different, uh, I have a different menu on mine. Really? Yeah. If I click your camera off, it'll, cu it, it'll cut down on bandwidth. Okay. I'll, uh, let's um, shut that back down then. Okay, we'll see what we can do. Uh, apparently, maybe maybe the world is evil today, and there's our little problem. Um, we'll have to run it that way. No, Kent Hovind is evil. The world is the, the world is entirely neutral, just like the rest of the yeah. universe. It does not care. Not that anyone will be uh, 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 any great loss not to see my mug directly uh, and just to see the picture <laughs> going. I mean, I'm not, I'm not that photogenic, but uh, sometimes I, I try to use visual things and I'm moving my hand around and all that and I kind of help on it. But that, that this does not normally happen. Most of the time, the video feed seems to be okay, so it may be just some weird thing with the amount of bandwidth that everybody's going on about it. So anyway, okay, we apologize on uh, on the troubles there uh anyway the uh, the new book with uh, jackson we're going to be uh, having a lot of fun with that one it's a it's a subject that hasn't been properly attacked properly and one of the people that we'll be going into will be jeffrey Tompkins, the uh, creationist geneticist who has not been criticized nearly enough uh there's been just a few people that have taken him on so this will all be fallow turf for us to go after uh, and we'll want to make sure that the, the material is as accurate and as meticulous as possible so that it's on the same standard that I did with Slam Dunk. So we take no prisoners uh, in this uh, work. And it'll be a useful reference book, uh, fully, fully indexed and coordinated. So um, it will be uh, a, a benchmark in the field. And hey, all you guys out there. Uh, uh, okay, so far so good on the sound. All righty. Um, that uh, everybody out there who hasn't got Slam Dunk uh, uh, please get it. Uh, if you don't know about it, uh, talk about those who do have the book and, and that, uh, tell them about it in your networks. Um, uh, that it would, the damn work won't do a damn bit of good. Um, if, um, uh, more people don't have it and let people higher up the food chain know, you know, I mean, it wouldn't hurt to say to Neil deGrasse Tyson or Jerry Coyne or anybody else say, Hey, do you know about the Slim Dog book? Uh, on Facebook postings and, and various other venues uh, uh, that, um, yes, it's a self-published thing, but it's a significant work. Uh, I was very pleased at the review that you everybody can read with Christine Janice. She did a little bit of talking about it because she brought the book up. She got it on her own. It wasn't even prodded by me. She was following my work. Uh, and um, it, it's on the subject that has not been properly covered before. It's why I wrote it. Um, there has never been a proper analysis of the reptile mammal transition and how creationists had missed the data on it. So I've done that. So what it means is that anybody who gets slam dunk is going to have themselves up to speed on the technical literature. They're going to know that subject inside out, a fabulous macroevolution case, and they're going to know literally every head up the ass dumb that every creationist has ever done on it. And also the stuff that's available online. Uh, so that means that if you bring the subject up, you know in advance what they could possibly throw back at you, and you'll already be there to drop anvils on them. I mean, I think that's a useful tool. <laughs> yeah, Brian says, maybe I can get Sean to read it. Not sure if he gets uh, eclectic a lot. Um, it's um, uh, intended as a... The, the one thing it lacks, and that's another reason if anybody out there in uh, Twitter land or in um, uh, YouTube land knows of a good publisher or publishing agent that's in this field, that too I could get uh, help on because I'd like to an illustrated second edition. That was the one thing that Christine Janice said it lacked was pictures, that there were uh, charts and uh, uh, paleontological illustrations that creationists were misrepresenting, that you needed to be able to see that stuff for you to go, whoa, this makes it even more killer. And uh, I didn't have rights to get to those, and I had to rush the book out in a hurry because I need the money. Uh, I, I'm just a social security guy here. That's why I got the damn GoFundMe, too. Uh, and so uh, an illustrated edition, I've got a big stack in a box downstairs that I'm ready to rip to do a, a full updated second edition, which would um, we would then get the illustrations that I want to put into it. I know what I want. And also um, update with the current technical information that's popped along in the two years since I wrote it. 
So this would be right up to speed on there. Anyway, we're doing the same approach with uh, the new book on the uh, the rocks are still there. It's uh, to to uh, fairly represent what the current understanding of the science is, to make it extremely up to date and current, fully indexed, fully documented, and uh, make sure that we don't miss anybody. So that we've really got to adjust. Uh, obliteration job on this so that anybody that reads the work will be up to speed in a way that you can't help but benefit. I think Don't that's a good Snelling. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's Snelling in there. I go after Snelling on the radiometric dating issue, that diamond thing. He misrepresented the diamond paper and uh, Mike Riddle copied him. And uh, in fact, I call attention to the fact that with Jackson Wheat and I's uh, um, interview with Riddle, he admitted yet again that he had never bothered to read the paper. Had no curiosity, uh -huh. it was now eight years uh, or on, and it, it, it never dawned on him that he might benefit from actually reading the primary source. No, 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 no. That, that would be silly. That would be learning shit. Yeah, the, the, the whole point is, is that I, I, I keep on telling people, another concept that I'm, I'm trying to see is the stupid Tortukan concept, and that hasn't started trending. Uh, I, I'm, the, it's a word that I think is useful, and the Tortukan alert is something that's useful. And we're working on it. We're working on it. Yeah, yeah, you got to make a use of it because any time, any time you bump into somebody, and it, it can be on politics as well as science, who clearly has a dogma that they don't fact check, that they just are impervious to evidence, that you can't get them to defend their source base, and that 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 deserves a Tortukan alert. That's that's who you're dealing with. And you're going to pop into them all the time. You're going to bump into that for all practical purposes. If somebody is an evolution doubter or a climate change skeptic, they've got to get a Tortukan alert at some point because otherwise they wouldn't have the views they do. And you find that with Trumplandia and a lot of the Trump supporters. Um, you find it on a lot of controversial issues. And it's not a politically limited thing that uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, and his anti vaxxer views get Tortukan alerts. So uh, it's, it's they not actually just. eat Tortugan alerts. There are some people, I tell you. Yeah, that I mean, everyone complains about flat Earth on a lot of our venues and that, but flat Earthers are trivial compared to anti-vaxxers because anti-vaxxers are really impacting directly the health of kids in a way yes, that flat Earthers are irrelevant. So this is far more important. You got to get your pecking order going. Uh, on the, uh, the the triage mode on things. The reason why creationism is more important to pay attention to than flat earth is because creationists are in public office. They're like the vice president and they're the secretary of health and human services and they're governors of states or ex-governors. They're in Congress. They're in state houses. They're doing laws that are going to impact people's lives. And you, we really need nobody, to kind of work. Nobody in power wants to admit they're an atheist. They lose three quarters of their voters that way. Well, we don't even need to have that aspect. Is that that if you have a methods approach to these issues, to where there are some basic benchmarks, everybody, reporters should be used to asking methods questions, and and some basic ones would be, how old do you think the Earth is? That weeds a lot of people out right there. Uh, that if they well, can't you figure have to out, understand. you have, if if you had. If you have an absolute uh, an absolute faith in God, you're not getting elected. That's just all there is. Well, that's, the reporters that's like to ask not at all. Questions. That's not at all certain in all demographics. We know from the Dover case that there were functionally young Earth creationists who were on that Dover school board, and they got on that Dover school board because they didn't tell everybody their full views. And it was only in the course of the Dover fracas that it became clear what these viewpoints were, and almost all of them were thrown out in the next election. So the idea that that there are going to get there are because they cost us over huge well, amounts but, of but money. Well, but also there were a lot of Is people there, that just it, they didn't necessarily reflect the population. Now, if there are certainly cases where, like the guy in Wyoming that got elected, he's a full blown young Earth creationist, um, and it was pretty much known about that. His electorate is very politically conservative and he got elected fair and square. Uh, but the point is, is that there shouldn't be the case that you shouldn't know that to begin with. If, if they still get elected, even with that fine and dandy, it's not fine and it's not dandy, but at least it's legal. But don't let anybody slip under the radar. And reporters don't tend to ask methods questions nearly enough. People don't tend to ask methods questions even enough. It's not a natural thing to do. 
uh, even Jackson uh, Wheat, uh, who um, uh, is a, a lover of methodology, when you're in the, the rough and tumble of the discussion, your instinct is to go to the data field and forget to examine the source methods of your opponent. And so it's, uh -huh. it's a thing that I've consciously had to work on in my own analysis to where the question that should always be ready in the wings is, oh, interesting, where did you get that information from and how did you check it? <laughs> That's a source methods question. And, and anybody who is a non-Tortukan should be willing to answer that question. But Tortukans are not going to want to explore their data field very well. Nobody, uh, the, the, the creationist will know often that they are getting their stuff from places they can't remember. And they know that it's not going to look good if they just say, oh, I don't know. So they will avoid the question. And that's where you'll get the dare in the headlight look. That's where you'll get them suddenly talking about something else altogether. The more people use that as a technique um, at the reporter level, I've been frustrated in my own research trying to find out how many actual creationists there are in public office. And, and it often doesn't come up until it hits a point when they're putting a anti-evolution uh, bill in their uh, committee. Uh, and then suddenly the NCSE is noticing it and you get to have a bit. But even then, it's not always obvious how you can determine what brand of anti-evolution they are. There's a difference between young earth creationists and uh, intelligent designers. They have different focuses. They're going to be bumping into, into a slightly different data field field in a lot of issues to where uh, a young earth creationist theoretically is going to have problems with anything involving radiometric dating. And so analyses of archaeology, our analysis of geology that, that it's going to complain, they're going to uh, grump about the dates that are put on national parks as to how old things are in a way that an intelligent designer won't. So knowing all of that is important. Well, sometimes you only find out about this information accidentally. There was one guy that was complaining about evolution and the reporter that was interviewing him just happened to mention some of the books on the shelf and one of which was a Duane Gish book. Well, that's a young earth creationist work. So bingo, that measures his reading field in a way that was should have been automatic for discussion, but instead we're getting this stuff accidentally. And, and to get more people onto this, interact with your local reporters. Make sure that they recognize the need in all of their things. This is an election year. You get a lot of good reporting on, on what positions are, but still that source methods element is often accidental. Uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers in my own home district here, who I have not voted for for quite some time, she's a fairly conservative Republican, but she's also uh, um, now a Trump supporter. And she, uh, a big pack that apparently is done, run by Paul Ryan's uh, bunch has come in with just a barrage of anti-Lisa uh, uh, Brown ads, uh, who Lisa Brown is the putative Democratic candidate, although there's a primary to go on, and I'm actually going to vote in the primary on um, one of her rivals, uh, a young guy, uh, Luther uh, or, or Sunderland's last name, John Sunderland, I think his first name is, uh, very uh, up and coming war veteran, uh, Democrat, uh, very progressive, and, and he probably won't win the nomination, but yeah, I'd like to give him my vote anyway. And then we'll we'll have the main thrash out later. But the thing is, is uh, the, the Republican PAC has already decided Brown is going to be the nominee, and they're just dredging up lies about her voting record regarding uh, that they she was voting uh, for the release of, of uh, child molesters when she was in the... And it, it's a blatant misrepresentation of her voting record on this. And uh, uh, so this is a methods question that um, uh, McMorris Rogers would need to defend this source base because she defended, uh, she said, I'm okay with this ad and she would have to defend things. I've, I've constantly, uh, uh, using uh, source methods to try to drag her on to the debate about, um, the tax cut, uh, and who it favors and who it doesn't. She doesn't like to discuss that. She's a Trump defender. She never said a peep about Helsinki, uh, after that. And all of these are data field issues and source methods issues. Um, as, a, as a constituent of her district, I have a perfect right to bring that subject up. Um, oh, uh, we got a, a comment there from uh, Israel. Uh, uh, being a creationist should ban anyone from public office because it demonstrates that you cannot tell fact from reality. I would be more general in saying that um, Tortukans should not be in, in positions of power. It's not just being a creationist. It's being people who are addicted to secondary sources, 
They're ideologically motivated for that reason. They don't fact check their source base. They have a very limited data field that they draw on um, that uh, they don't really think through what they think happens in regarding even their limited data field and they have no standards for changing mind. Uh, if I still have my camera on, I'd be raising my fingers on each one of these examples because those are the four core Tortukan issues. Uh, those are the diagnostics. You'll notice not one of those is about content. It's about method. Two of them are a source methods thing, They're the, the secondary source reliance, the limited data field. The other two are cognitive, the, their inability to work out map of time, which is that what do you think happened, and their uh, inability to conceptualize evidence to change their mind. And anybody that ho has those characteristics, regardless of the content, even if they believe things that are true, if they, if you discover that they've got some weird little belief, they think, you know, that they think they're, they're perfectly normal on everything, but they think that there are lizard beings that are responsible for Atlantis, um, then, you know, you should go, whoa, Tartukan alert. Okay, there we go. And, and that means if they can be wrong so badly on one thing like that, then it makes them unreliable, even if they seem reasonable in other contexts. Now, if they are a full-blown creationist, then they're ticking off a bunch of those problems. And, and uh, they will be unreliable if they're trying to deal with healthcare issues, if they're trying to deal with how to reform the Veterans Administration, if they're trying to deal with environmental policy. It's no coincidence that when you ask people, and I make a point of doing it constantly, uh, when I'm bumping into Trumpistas and Dinesh D'Souza and Ann Coulter and all that, I'm trying to find out, are there supporters what their position is on evolution and what their position is on climate change. Because the anti-evolution movement is almost entirely climate change denialists. And they use exactly the same method to do that that they do to go after evolution. So these methods issues are not uh, rarefied. They're not abstract. They relate to how you deal with data field and how you approach issues outside of just the narrow range of just the religion science issues. They're, they're, they have practical applications and practical pitfalls. So my big drum that I'm beating is that source methods matter. And the more people who learn the techniques and apply it in everything they do at every level of their thinking will become better thinkers, they'll become better citizens, they'll become more reasonable and fair. They'll, they'll always, if they, they, they get outraged about something, it's not because it's just a simple dogma, it's because they're outraged because it's wrong. And it's wrong because that you can see the data and you can see that it's a misrepresentation. And you get your burr in your bonnet about that, like I do when, and SciStrike does about vaxxers. You know, this, this is where source methods bites. And it has a direct impact upon people's lives. And it's a bad idea. So, uh, tires. You can't stand them. <laughs> You're going to deny that space even exists. I'm going to kick you. <clears throat> yeah, you, and, and so the Tortuga alert, a hashtag is a handy one to pop up. Let me put it up here so everyone can see it. But if you don't use it, it doesn't exist. I don't, at the moment, I'm pretty invisible and the viewpoints are invisible. I've tried to get the Tortukan word going. Uh, Jerry Coyne just had a ballistic fit uh, that I was trying to use this neologism and he wouldn't allow it. No, it's not a real word. And uh, so I, I can never use it around him because uh, even though I can use analogs, but the analog, you know, cognitive dissonance, Dunning-Kruger, they all relate to the phenomenon, but they, they're they more specific than what I'm doing if I say that somebody is a Tortugan. And uh, um, it's a, a, a side issue term that I would love to see more commonly used because it means my ideas are kind of taking hold to where if somebody says, uh-oh, he's a Tortugan, you don't have to explain to everybody what the hell that means. They go, yeah, oh boy, is he a Tortugan. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but it's like uh, to see. Yeah. Huh. Hey, yeah. Yeah. You in there someplace? Yeah. You were going to yeah. say something and you got caught. No, I, I wasn't. Okay, no. Well, the, the cap, is, cap is drowsy. We're past our hour anyway. Yeah, I kind of um, off for a bit and I, yeah, I just woke up about. Kind of a little bit of a go. Cap's yeah. sleeping <laughs> patterns are notorious on these videos because yeah. sometimes he also <laughs> snores and uh, we can hear him sawing wood and we realize, uh oh, Cap is gone, la la, okie dokie. There we go. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, Cap, is, um, Cap, Cap booted himself. 
Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I've got links to my website, as usual, up in the uh, video description. I've got a direct link to Slam Dunk. Uh, anybody who wants to help the GoFundMe, I'm not going to argue with you. Anyone who gets the book, uh, I get royalties off of that, so I can use that on that front. Uh, that the, the more the merrier. But keep spreading. If you've got the book or my novel, make sure you rate and review it on wherever you got it from. I've been monitoring that to see that, and that's slow as molasses. Uh, our side is often really slow to connect up on things and it's frustrating even people that have my work they'll go back to their rote listing of copy paste on uh, talk origins or the thing they're used to doing and then I'll have to bring up uh, slam dunk and I would like to see I will know I'm successful um, when I can make a living at what I'm doing or have enough supplement to where I'm not worried about each month where my books are all published by regular publishers, so I'm, I may make less royalties that way, but I'll be actually going on book signing tours that way, where I'm lecturing more. Um, uh, Peter was asking after she, he saw my lecture that I gave in Seattle, I got the video up on that, he says, why am I not book solid? And I'm going, I'm wondering that myself. I mean, I'm not a bad talker, and I think I'm great at, even, even Pete Bogassian was flabbergasted at how well I do Q&A. He's terrified of doing Q&As. He gets very stilted on that, but I love it. I, it's improv theater for me. I enjoy that enormously. And I would love to build that reputation of where the old RJ really doesn't debate very often, not because he won't, but because he strikes terror into the hearts of the Wooists everywhere. And um, I haven't reached that stage yet. So I'm not successful. I'd like to be successful. I would like to enjoy some of my posthumous fame while I'm still alive. And uh, <laughs> I'm plugging away at it, though. I'll, I'll say this. I'm proud of everything I've written. I, do, I put myself full bore into everything that I do. I never do anything half-assed. I, I try to do the best I possibly can. Slam Dunk is not a minor work. I pulled out the stops on that little puppy. And it may be a little dry, science-y, textbook -y for CAP, but <laughs> nothing in it will be inaccurate. It'll be oh, yeah. a solid resource that you can draw Actually, off of. Actually, I found, I, I found it a much better read than your average textbook. Uh, I tried got to kind of a, got kind of an easy conversational tone that really that, that doesn't yeah, the, work. The thing that threw some people off, the what, what throws some people off is something that for me doesn't throw me off at all, is that I can have what would be like a box over in the corner, but I didn't want to do it that way because I didn't want to have more complicated paid pagination than I already had, uh, where you would have a, a, a thing that would list off the various technical sources for a, a spot topic. So I'd say, here on the matter of endosymbiosis, and here's a bunch of technical literature, and I put them all in chronological order so that you can follow through and track the evolution of the field by those. And it's a lot of technical references, and I'm not telling you the titles of them, it's just the name et al. 2000, blah, blah, blah. And then you find the references in the far end. Well, you go down to the end of the paragraph, and there's the next paragraph where I continue the story. For me, that's not a problem to do, but there are actually some people that I know who just seize up where they, 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 they want to read every single one of those little et owls and it's throwing them out because it's not narrative and, and it, they need to get into the swing of it. Uh, that's another thing that you just kind of got to get used to on that. I suppose in a regular publisher mode, we would do it as a side box over in the corner, but that's why I would like to have a publisher that's got editorial people and graphics people that can do all that stuff effortlessly. That's tougher for me to do. Uh, in the context that I'm doing. I, 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 I have a lot of talents, but I'm not omnidirectional. I can't do everything. <laughs> you can tell that from my videos. I'm not Mr. Video. <laughs> yeah, and it's, uh, like I said, it's a really good book. It's just certain parts. It gets so-and-so, da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da, citation, da-da-da-da-da. Like, and, and there's a few parts where it's like that, and it can be a little dry in the reading. But then again, it's not meant to be a uh, great, fun and like, the, the scientists, though, in the field there, and Christine Janice was an example of it, that she was just eating all that up because she found new information she didn't know about in her own field as a result of all of that. And that was a pat on my back as to how thorough I am. Well, I'm granting on here, uh, and we, we can uh, stop the project uh, for tonight, and we'll hopefully be back next week if I, unless I'm struck by lightning. And uh, thank you all, and uh, help join the parade, become a methodologist, uh, use Tortukan Alert, find out about Tortukans, use the word, make it trending. I'd love to have something I do trend. Okay, bye. <laughs>